This pack of cards is the best investment you will make in you or your child's education this year. This pack of over 100 cards will not only help you to learn and recall 56 major events from history, what they were and when they were, it will also teach you a variety of ancient memory tricks, some of which have been around for thousands of years. Quiz Tricks engages your mind in a way that unlocks all the underlying memory power that you never knew you had. Once you've committed a number of events to your memory, you'll be surprised at the amount of other knowledge that starts getting stuck to these memory pegs. The fog of time will literally begin to lift and you'll start to see history in a whole new light. In the rest of this video, I'll take you through a selection of cards from our World History for Kids pack and show you how it works. If you like what you see, watch the video a few more times over the next few weeks. Once you're hooked, support our Kickstarter campaign and receive your very own pack of Quistrix World History cards. Quistrix contains a whole host of memory hacks that make learning key facts more fun. For every event, you will come across crazy mnemonic images. These images are far, far easier for our brain to process and recall, and will be the first entertaining step on your memory journey. All you then need is an ancient code and you can unlock the power of your mind. Quistrix is no ordinary card game. Whilst you play with your friends, you'll be starting to engage nine memory hacks. I will point some of these out along the way. Before we start, let's have a look at that ancient memory code, the major system. The code relates certain numbers to letters. We use those letters as the start of words. We then create a crazy image so we can remember our code phrase. In this example, we are encoding the date of the Watergate scandal that happened in 1972. Using the major system, the seven is a C and the two is an N. I'll explain more about that later. We make a phrase that has a word beginning with C, a word beginning with N and something that sounds a bit like Watergate and is more memorable. We get cocky Neanderthal water skiing. To remember this event and date, create your first memory peg. You just need to remember cocky Neanderthal water skiing. After you've done this a few times, this all becomes second nature. So let's give it a try. It can be really motivating along the way to keep a score each time you watch the video and we'd love to hear how you get on. You can use our format or one of your own. OK, so these are our first two events and you'd see these cards in a quiz tricks memory pack. The major system is visible around the edges to help you. The first event is the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza around 2580 BCE. You just need to remember Frankfurter Sausage Giza. Yep. To stop for a second and imagine this hot jet of sausages whooshing out of the ground in front of you is pretty hard to forget. The other event is the Battle of Waterloo, where British and Prussian forces led by the Duke of Wellington finally defeated Napoleon Bonaparte and his French army. 1815 is encoded in Tarantas lurking in the loo. Again, pretty hard to forget. OK, so now leave those images in your mind and we'll come back to them in a minute. But before we do, let's have a bit of a quiz on your knowledge of those two events. So here's four questions about the pyramids. Question one, the pyramids are in which country? Have a think. Yep, in Egypt. Well done if you got that. Next question, what were the pyramids used as? Okay, they're the graves of the early pharaohs or tombs. And next question, was Cleopatra buried in a pyramid? So was Cleopatra buried in a pyramid? No, Cleopatra actually lived 2,000 years ago and the pyramids were built about 2,000 years before that, so about 4,000 years ago. So big difference. And final question, the pyramids are a world wonder. Can you name another one, another wonder of the world? OK, and here's a list of the wonders of the world, the Colossus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Lighthouse in Alexandria, the Artemis Temple, the Zeus Statue in Olympia and the Mausoleum at Helicarnassus. OK, so well done if you've got one of those. Let's move on. Here's four questions now um, about the Battle of Waterloo. So who fought in the Battle of Waterloo? I did mention it earlier. OK, the British and the Prussians. Prussia is now what we call Germany, uh, fought against the French. Next question, the French leader escaped from prison on Elba and gathered an army to fight at Waterloo. How long did that take? How long did it take for him to gather that army? 
Okay, only a hundred days. So he brought together a massive army really quickly. Who was the French leader at the battle? Who was the man who did that? Yep, that was Napoleon. And how did the weather help the British and the Prussians to win the battle? Okay, it was raining and Napoleon's horses got stuck in the mud. They were, um, the French cavalry were the one of the best trained cavalries, cavalries, I should say, in the world. And they normally caused uh, devastating um, destruction to the enemy. But in this case, because of the wet ground, they couldn't. So that really helped. Okay, let's go on. Can you remember the date, the event, or the mnemonic code sentence uh, for any of these two images that we did before? The more times you come back and, and look at these, the easier it gets. So on one side, what's that image? What's the sentence that goes to that image? And then what's the one with the toilet or the loo? Okay, let's have a look. So here are the cards. You've got Frankfurter Sausage Geezer. Um, that gives us an F because F equals um, eight from Frankfurter because a curly F looks a bit like an eight and the S gives us zero because S and Z are similar and have similar sounds. We use another phrase for the century, nearly lunchtime, and that gives us a two and a five. So we've then got tarantulas lurking in the loo, gives T equals one because it's one downstroke in the letter T and L gives us five because L is a Roman numeral for 50. The century is again encoded as toilet fatalities, which gives us a one and eight. So that gives us 1815. OK, don't worry about that too much. You will build this up as we go through the video. So using those images and phrases, we can then encode the dates using the first letters of those words. OK, let's try some more events. Here we go. This time we have the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863 with chimp munches spaghetti too fiery and we got Caesar crossing the Rubicon River in 498, uh, 49 BCE, sorry. And that's ring with a precious ruby. So at this point, just try and remember the images and the associated phrases. Pause the video if you want to spend a bit longer looking at them. OK, and here's four questions about the Battle of Gettysburg. Question one. The Battle of Gettysburg was part of which war? OK. That was the American Civil War. Well done if you got that. Who fought whom at the battle? And you may call the armies uh, different things. There's lots of ways they were referred to, but we've got these ones. Um, the Northern States, which was the Union Army against the Southern States, which was the Confederacy. And what was the main reason the Civil War was fought over? What was the main reason the Civil War was fought over? OK, and that's the South wanted to keep slavery and the North wanted to abolish it. And the next one, which American president had a famous speech on the battlefield a few months later? So which American president, American president had a famous speech on the battlefield a few months later? OK, and that is Abraham Lincoln. OK, here's four questions then about Caesar crossing the Rubicon. OK, the Rubicon River in Caesar's time was a border between what? So what was the river of border between? Okay. The center of the empire, known as the Italy proper, and a remote Roman province called Gaul. Okay. So what made Caesar's crossing of the river so shocking? Why was it a problem that he crossed this river? Okay, and he crossed the river with an army and marched to attack Rome itself. So once you cross the Rubicon, you essentially had entered Italy proper and that meant that you had become a traitor because you weren't allowed to cross the army, uh, cross the river with your army bearing arms because that meant you were essentially going to attack Rome. So you meant to leave, you know, leave your army behind when you cross the Rubicon, which he didn't do. OK, what does it mean when we say to someone, say that someone crossed the Rubicon today? So if we use that phrase today, what does it mean? It means someone has reached a point of no return and is now gambling and risking everything to win. So think that in mind, what was Caesar's gamble then by crossing the Rubicon? Well, if he hadn't won, which was four years later, um, he and his soldiers would have been put to death. So once you cross the Rubicon, you're a traitor unless obviously you win and defeat the people in power in Rome at the time. OK, let's have another look. Uh, here's the two images. Can you 
recall the mnemonic phrases and do they start to help you recall the date so we've got the chimp on one side and we've got the the ring with a ruby on the other so can you remember what those phrases were here they come so we've got chimp munch, munches spaghetti too fiery on one side the ch equals six because the ch makes a similar sound to the x at the end of six and the m gives us three because m has three downstrokes and looks like the number three rotated so that that gives us 63 and the century is too fiery one and eight so we have 1863 then we have ring with a precious ruby the r gives us four because capital r looks like a four reflected and p gives us a nine because it's a nine reflected so we get the 49 okay stop and pause the video if you need to have a little bit longer looking at that otherwise we'll move on so here we have the two images from earlier. Can you remember what the mnemonic phrases are for these two images? You've got the sausages on one side and we've got the tarantulas on the other. Okay, let's move on and see. Okay, so here are the cards. Frankfurter sausage geezer gives us F equals eight, remember, because it, a swirly F looks like an eight and S gives us the zero. Um, we use another phrase for the century again. Nearly lunchtime gives us two and a five. And tarantulas lurk in the loo. The T gives us a one. The L gives us a five. And the century is encoded as toilet fatalities, one and eight. Okay, let's try two more events. Okay, so here are the next two events. The death of the great Mongolian leader Genghis Khan in 1227. Nose clogged with candy, tissue needed. Great image. Uh, the n equals two and the c equals seven because the letter k looks like two sevens joined together and c has the same sound as a k and the date that the taj mahal was built okay in 1632 and that's given as masked ninja is touched by a tray of chocolates so it's a nice feeling to get a tray of chocolates um, the m is three and the n is two which gives us a 1632 and the one and six is encoded in T and CH from tray of chocolates. Okay, see how much of that you can remember. If you want to pause the video and just work through that, look at the different phrases and look at the code around the edge, please do. Otherwise, let's move on. Okay, here's four questions about Genghis Khan. Question one, which empire did Genghis Khan run? Okay, that was the Mongol Empire. And Genghis Khan's empire had a brand new way to fight. What was that? What was their brand new way of fighting? Okay, they fought with bows and arrows on horseback and nobody had any defense against that. That had not been done before. And next question, Genghis Khan made many people they conquered rich. How did they do that? How did they make the states and territories they conquered richer? Okay, he basically is because they made it safer um, because it stopped um, robbers along the Silk Road so that people could trade more safely. So there's more trade, so people made more money. And what else helped Genghis Khan run such a large empire with so many different people? So can you think of something else that helped him? OK, and that was religious freedom, uh, cultural exchange between regions, a code of law and a super fast communication system or network with horses and riders. So all those things. If you've got any one of those, well done. If you didn't, now you know. So let's go on. Okay, so here's four questions about the Taj Mahal. Which country is the Taj Mahal in? Okay, and that was India in the city of Agra. Next question. The Indian emperor built the Taj Mahal for someone else. Who was that? And that was for his wife, who he loved very much. And what do the Taj Mahal and the pyramids have in common? It's a good question. What do they have in common? Okay, they were built as a grave for someone important. The Taj Mahal was built as a grave for his wife and represents his love for her. So it's a, lot, a place where a lot of people go to celebrate their love. And which religion did the Indian mogul who built the Taj Mahal practice? he was a muslim okay let's move on okay so before we go on to new events can you remember what these two images represent can you remember any of the details pause the video if you need to the process of trying to remember actually strengthens your memory pathway so try and recall what the mnemonic phrases are and then we'll skip on 
And here they are. Pause the video and have a good look. You can use the code around the side of the screen to help you make the links between the mnemonic code phrase, the image and the event and the date. The more you stop and do this purposeful practice, the sooner you'll become fluent in this ancient method and build up a strong knowledge schema. When you're ready, let's skip on. OK, so here's the next two events, two very significant scientific breakthroughs which have shaped our world. OK, this time I'll let you read them for yourself. We have linked Sir Isaac Newton's theory of gravity with the graveyard because it's more spooky and therefore more memorable. And we've linked Einstein's theory of relativity to a relay race because you can imagine that more um, easily in your brain, especially if lions are involved. Pause the video if you need more time to look at the images and phrases. However, don't be too hard on yourself. Some in images will go in easier than others. And once you've had a look, move on. OK, so we've got shifty shadows in a graveyard and speedy lines relay. Let's move on. OK, what do you know about Newton? Here's a question. Newton discovered gravity when something fell on his head. What was that? It was reputably an apple. OK, things do not simply fall down. How does gravity work? OK, all objects attract each other. The earth pulls on the apple, but the apple also pulls on the earth and things are pulled towards the, the centre of the earth. OK, how much stronger is the earth's gravity than the moon's? That's a good question. About six times. OK, and which daily phenomenon on the earth is caused by the moon? So can you think of something that happens daily that is caused by the moon? And that's the tides, the sea going in and out. OK. And here's some questions about Einstein. Albert Einstein liked to be silly. What did he do in one famous image to make everyone laugh? Can you picture an image of Albert Einstein doing something silly? Yep, he stuck his tongue out. Um, this theory of relativity that he came up with is complicated, but has one short equation with only three different letters in it. What is it? Can you remember that Einstein equation? There it is, e, e equals mc squared. And then Einstein found out that the faster you go, the slower time goes. How fast do you have to be so that time actually stops, according to his theory? Okay, so if you travel at the speed of light, apparently time stops. Cool. Okay, Einstein found that if you go faster than the speed of light, time would go backwards. What stops that from happening? No matter, no matter how hard you try, nothing can ever, ever travel faster than the speed of light. So that's his theory. So you can't actually make time goes backwards. OK, so here's the two images for those two events. Can you remember the mnemonic phrases? Have a think and remember the effort of remembering strengthens those memory pathways. So you've got a spooky graveyard on one side and a lion doing a relay on the other. Here they are. You've got shifty shadows in a graveyard that SH and SH give you the 66. And then you've got the speedy lions relay. The S gives you the zero and the L gives you the five for 1905. OK. OK, so here's two images you've seen before. So before we move on, can you remember anything about these? A bit of space retrieval practice for you. You've got a chimp on one side. It looks like he's eating spaghetti. It looks quite hot. And on the other side, we've got a, a ruby ring. So can you remember the mnemonic phrases for these? And can you even remember the date and event? Have a think. OK, let's skip on. OK, here they are. We've got chimp munches spaghetti, too fiery. The CH gives us a six and the M gives us a three because M has those three downstrokes and looks like the number three rotated. So that's your 63. And the century is too fiery, one and eight. So we have 1863. And the other one was ring with a precious ruby. The R gives us a four because capital R looks like a four reflected and P gives us a nine because it's a nine reflected. Well done. You're starting to get to know that secret code. Don't stress if you're not. It takes a while, but if it's the first time you've done it and you're starting to remember things, great. OK, OK, here's two new events. We've got the book, The Lord of the Rings, being published in 1954. And we remember that with Leisurely Relaxed King. King obviously linking to ring. Um, the Leisurely and the Relaxed, the L gives us a five and the R gives us a four. So that gives us the 54. 
and the taking a bath gives us the 19 and then we've got starry night painted by vincent van gogh in 1889 we remember that we're fleeing bloodthirsty starfish starfish linking to starry night the f gives us an eight and the b gives us a nine tripping is fatal reminds us it's in the 19th century 18. okay so let's skip on and let's have some quiz facts about these Okay, so the first question is, The Lord of the Rings is a sequel to which other book by J.R. Tolkien? Okay, let's have a look. The Hobbit, or There and Back Again. So who is the main Hobbit character in The Lord of the Rings book? Not The Hobbit book, The Lord of the Rings book. Okay, that's Frodo Baggins. It's Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit. And then four of the seven hobbit meals the hobbits love their meal times and they've got seven different meal times during the day can you remember them okay you got breakfast second breakfast amazing elevensies luncheon afternoon tea dinner and supper it's absolutely the perfect day and then you've got the lord of the rings is set in which fantastical world do you know what world it's set in middle earth well done if you got that Okay, now we've got some questions about the painting Starry Night. So first question, who painted the painting Starry Night? And that was Vincent van Gogh. And the next question is, the painting is a beautiful view at night. Van Gogh painted it looking out of the window of what? So where was he? So it's the view from the hospital that he was spending time in at that time. So next question, what was so new about the way that Vincent van Gogh painted? Okay, it was that he didn't care so much about what things looked like in reality, but how they made him feel. And he represented that with colours and brush strokes. Okay, next question, he uses a lot of blue in this painting. What do you think that means? And van Gogh uses blue because he was feeling blue. He's feeling sad because he was in hospital. So that's why we often say feeling blue, don't we? Okay, next one. Can you remember the details recorded in these images? So we've just seen them. Can you remember the mnemonic phrases that will help you remember the dates and start building those memory pegs in your mind? Have a think, you've got the king in a bath, you've got some starfish there. Okay, we've got leisurely relaxed king taking a bath and we've got fleeing bloodthirsty starfish. Tripping is fatal. Okay, so here's two more from earlier. Can you remember the images for that, the phrases for these images? Got your sausages on one side and your tarantulas on the other. Yep, you got Frankfurter sausage geezer on one side and the tarantulas lurking in the loo on the other. So you got Waterloo and the pyramids of Giza. Okay, here's two more events. So we've got Hitler invades Poland and Washington becomes president. If you take a little bit of time, pause the video, you now know how to look at the mnemonic phrases and relate those to the code around the outside and the image. Try and remember them. When you're re ready, unpause the video and we'll move on. OK, so here's some questions about Hitler. What did Hitler say was the reason for attacking Poland? Well, basically, he lied. He said that uh, Polish soldiers had attacked a German radio tower when actually it was German officers who'd done that. OK, next question. Hitler invaded a lot of countries. So what makes invading Poland so special? Okay, so basically it started World War II because it was the first time that other countries fought back as allies of Poland. Next question, which superpower did not immediately fight back and why? So which superpower didn't join World War II at this point? And that was Russia, uh, at the time called the USSR. Hitler had a secret pact with them to divide Poland between them. So at that point they were quite happy with how things were progressing. Um, when, so when did the USSR begin to fight back and why and that's because Hitler surprised them two years later and launched the biggest attack ever against them with 10 million soldiers okay let's move on here's some questions about George Washington first question what is the difference between a president and a king well, kings are not voted in and rule for life. Presidents normally are elected and serve just for a few years. Next question, why is George Washington becoming president such a special event? And that's because he was the first president of any large country in the world. So quite a turning point in history. 
The next question is, the American states were ruled by which country before they decided to rule themselves? So who ruled the American states before they ruled themselves? They were actually British colonies run by King George III. So there you go. Then how did the Americans become independent? How did they break away from the British? Well, they started a war against the British in 1775, declared independence in 1776, and opened their own parliament in 1789. So you had the American War of Independence, which began in 1775. Very famous war. OK, so you know the drill now. Can you remember those visual mnemonics that we used to remember these two events? Here they come. So here they are. We've got munching bland polenta on one side and fishing in a pile of washing. Well done if you remember those. So there's all the details around the edge again. If you want to have a stop and pause the video and have a look. Remember in the Quizrix card game, the actual card game itself, you get a chance to peek at cards to remind yourself about the details stored in the images. You can even steal cards you know that you know from other players. So you have them in your deck instead. So it's a great game to play. If you like this, find out more about Quizrix, the card game. OK, let's move on. OK, so we got the Battle of the Somme. On one side here, 1916, with dizzy sheep somersaults, the D giving us the 1 and the SH giving us the 6. And then we've got Fall of Constantinople, we're listening to music constantly. Uh, the L gives us the 5 and the M gives us the 3. So that's a really good start if you can remember those two. I love the dizzy sheep somersaults. That's a great image. So let's move on and see if you can hold on to those images while we do some quiz questions. OK, which war was the Battle of the Somme fought in? Here we go. The World War One. OK, do we say that someone is entrenched when they stubbornly refuse to change? What has that got to do with the Battle of the Somme? The soldiers dug out trenches and fought for months without any movement. They were entrenched in those deep World War One trenches. Which flower grew on the battlefield and is now used as a symbol of remembrance? Clue, it's red. It's a poppy. OK, and the German Kaiser and the British King fought each other, but they had the same granny. Who was their grandma? It was Queen Victoria. How about that? So it's a bit of a family fight. OK, on we go. Here's some questions about Constantinople. What is the name of the city of Constantinople today? That's right, it's Istanbul. And which trick did the Ottomans use to get their ships in position to attack the city of Constantinople? City Harbour was shut off by a big chain, so they dragged the ships around over the land, around the chain, so they could get in. OK, Constantinople had one of the biggest churches at the time, the Hagia Sophia. What did the Ottomans do with that huge church? They turned it into a beautiful mosque. And Mehmet, the Ottoman leader, went on to fight another famous, gruesome leader. Who was that? So he went on to fight someone quite famous. And that's Vlad the Impaler, who started the Legends of Count Dracula, because he used to impale people on spikes. OK. So back to the images. Can you remember what the mnemonic phrases and details are that go with these two? We've got the sheep there doing some somersaults. And we've got someone listening to music there. Here you go. We've got dizzy sheep somersaults and listening to music constantly. So if you start to remember those, well done. Here's a bit of revision. We've got the chimp and we've got the ring again. Can you remember what these mnemonic phrases were? Yep, yeah, we've got chimp munches spaghetti and ring with a precious ruby. Well done if you're starting to remember those. And then we're going on to something different. We've got the Battle of Marathon here and the gunpowder used for the first time during in warfare. So pause the video if you want to. Have a look, try and remember those phrases. We've got a rambunctious parrot zumba. Looks like fun with their maracas. And buzzing stingray chowder. That would be quite spicy to eat, I should imagine. So get those images in your head. Make those links between chowder and gunpowder, maracas and marathon. And then move on when you're ready. OK, here's some questions about the Battle of Marathon. Which famous sport event is inspired by the battle? Yep, that's the marathon run itself. So what is the story behind that marathon run? Do you know it? 
Okay, so the Athenians won the battle and one soldier ran all the way back to Athens and shouted, we won and died of exhaustion. And they say he ran the distance, which is now the distance for the marathon race. And who did the Athenians fight in this battle? Okay, and that was the Persians. And the final question here, 10 years later, the Persians came back. What happened to them at the Battle of Thermopylae? Okay, so 300 Spartans held them up for three days, killing about 20,000 Persians. The weakened Persian army went on to lose against the Athenians. And that's uh, remembered in a film, The 300. So it's a very well-known story. Okay, so, so here's some questions about gunpowder. What happens when gunpowder with gunpowder if you hit it hard with a hammer? If you hit it really hard, it actually might explode. Amazing. How did gunpowder help Mehmet II conquer Constantinople? People thought the city wall was so strong it could not be breached, but Mehmet's huge cannons shot holes into it. I mean, it was legendary. The walls of Constantinople had been there for a long time and protected the city. So the use of gunpowder was the first time those walls were breached. OK, so how is gunpowder used to make cannons work? How does it work? OK, so you put gunpowder in the cannon and a cannonball on top and then the you hit or light the gunpowder and the cannonball flies out the end. OK, next question. Gunpowder was used in the gunpowder plot in, in England. By whom and what did he want to do? OK, that was Guy Fawkes or Guido Fawkes. And he tried to blow up the king and the Houses of Parliament in 1605. OK, so can you remember the mnemonic phrases for these two images? You've got your parrots and the maracas and then you've got the. Do you remember what they are? Yep, you've got your buzzing stingray chowder and then you've got your rambunctious parrot zumba. So if you want to pause the video and have a little look at the details and put them in your mind, that's fine. Otherwise, we'll skip on. At this point, if it's the first time you've had a look at this video, you're going to be starting to feel probably like there's a lot of information going into your head, that's fine. Stop the video, come back later. If you're still going strong, well done. If it's your second, third time, you've probably got to this point and remembering a lot more. So wherever you are, just do what's right for your brain. If you're feeling a bit overcooked, stop for a bit, come back later. OK, let's skip on. OK, can you remember these two from earlier? We've got the frankfurters on one side and the tarantulas again. Yep, you've got your Frankfurter sausage geezer and your tarantulas lurking in the loo. So if you want to stop and pause the video and explore this one again, you can. Otherwise, we'll move on. OK, now we've got two new events. Printing press invented by uh, Gutenberg and the com composition of the Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. So we've got 1436 here for the printing press. This time we got magically jinxed princess with those antlers sticking out of her head. And this time we've got the six represented by J. Uh, because a j and a sh and a ch all make similar sounds. Um, the other letters we know. And we've got biting a juicy fig. Again, the six is represented by a j for the same reason. OK, spend some time having a look at these and then we'll move on. OK, so who invented the printing press and where? That was Johann Gutenberg in this German city of Mainz. And printing had actually been invented in another country 500 years earlier. Where do you think that was? Yep, China. And how were books made before the invention of the printing press? And they were actually copied by hand and often decorated with beautiful images called illumination. So obviously it took a long time for one book to be copied. And could normal people read hand copied books? What, what do you think? The average person, could they read these books before printing happened? And the answer there is a resounding no. Not many people were able to read and most books were written in Latin, a language that only priests could really speak. So, yeah, the books were really off limits to most people before Gutenberg invented the printing press and written language became shared amongst so many more people. So here are some questions about Mozart. Mozart took a play and added music and singing. What do you call a play with singing? That's an opera only singing, or a musical, some singing. The Marriage of Figaro is an opera. OK, Mozart was very young when he started making music. How old was he when he started? He actually composed his first major work when he was only five, a minuet and trio in G major. And which country was Mozart from? He was actually Austrian from the city of Salzburg. 
And finally, Mozart wrote 22 operas and 41 symphonies. How rich was he then when he died? Well, sadly, he had no money and there was nothing left to pay for a burial. He was actually buried in an unmarked grave. Sad end for an amazing person. OK, can you remember any of the details for these images? Stop and have a look. You've got the princess there and you've got the fig there. OK, have a think. And here we go. So we've got the magically jinxed princess and the biting a juicy fig. Stop, pause the video if you want to take some time digesting these and then we'll move on. OK, do you remember this one? You've got the Frankfurters and the Tarantulas again. Here we go. It's another one you might remember, this time the chimp and the ring. Pause if you need time. And now we've got the parrots with the maracas and we've got the stingrays there, the chowder. Do you remember those ones? Well done if you're starting to get these. And on to our last event. So here we are. We have the date of the first democracy and the date of the Battle of Issus, where Alexander the Great defeated Darius III and his Persian army. So last two events in, in this video. So stop, have a look. We've got a large soaked flabby demon. Love that image. And mean muffins with mutation issues. <laughs> two fabulous images to end on. One encodes 508 BCE and one encodes 333 BCE. Now one's got MMM for 333 and one's got LSF for 508. OK, let's have some last questions. In a monarchy, a king or queen rules the country. Who rules the country in a democracy? OK, and that's the people who live in the country. They rule by voting. In ancient Greece, all citizens were asked to vote for or against every new rule or law. What is different in our democracy? Well, we vote for politicians in general elections and they get to make all the rules in a place called Parliament. And that can vary from country to country, but it's generally how democracy works in the modern world. Was everyone able to vote in ancient Greece? Nope. Women, slaves and anyone who was not born in Athens was not invited to vote. And after democracy in ancient Greece stopped in 404 BC, how long did it take until the next democracy? Well, shockingly, more than 2000 years, the next democracy was started in 1776 in the USA. Wow, that's a long time. And here's some questions about Alexander the Great. Where was Alexander the Great from? He was from the region of Macedonia, which is in modern day Greece. Um, Alexander was so successful because he had a great education. Who was his teacher? You'll know this name. It was Aristotle, who was the most famous philosopher of all times, together with his own teachers, Plato and Socrates. So Alexander conquered Egypt and became Egyptian king. What were Egyptian kings called? Yep, Pharaoh. And Alexander was the first Greek king of Egypt. Who was the last Greek queen of Egypt? And that was Cleopatra 300 years later. OK, well done. Here they are. Can you remember what these two images, what phrases they represent? Have a think. Got your muffins on one side, your monster on the other. So we've got lard soaked flabby demon and mean muffins with mutation issues. Brilliant. Have to take again, take some time if you want to explore this one a bit more and digest it. OK, so that, now that's the end of the quiz. If you like the way quiz tricks cards work, then you'll love the card game, which you can play with friends, family, a far more social way of learning important facts and dates and building up your knowledge web. The stronger your initial knowledge web, the easier you'll find it to learn and remember new information and the quicker you'll become an expert. The best investment in knowledge you'll ever make. Some people use the cards as flashcards even, choosing the events that are most important to them and regularly using the cards to help practice quick recall of the event details. OK, so another way to use the cards is to create a story. Place the events you want to remember in chronological order and then make up a crazy story using the images and characters from the cards. You can make the story happen somewhere you know well, like your own hometown. Our brains are designed to remember the story, so this is a great way to remember the events in the right order and remember those images that help you recall the phrases and then the dates. Before long, you will be able to recall the dates with very little effort. So 
Good luck on your quiz tricks journey. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter or LinkedIn. Support our campaign on Kickstarter and make sure we can keep making new packs and videos for years to come. Thanks. See you next time.